Well, through the course of these summits, there's all sorts of arcane and complex debate, but I also think there's a lot of theatre and drama that goes on. We're not party to what goes on in the room, but a lot of briefings go on in the press room below us. A lot of people from different camps come out and tell us how it, it's unfolding. And, of course, there are a lot of people with an awful lot at stake in what is going on upstairs in the meeting room. And one of them, of course, is Nigel Farage, the head of uh, the UK Independence Party. It's good to see you. Thank um, you. Of course you have a stake in it, and you've, I suppose in some respects, brought some of this about. Well, without UKIP there would never have been a referendum. You know, the, the Bloomberg speech was designed to get UKIP off his back and to try and neutralise uh, the EU issue. What, of course, he didn't reckon with, and we didn't reckon with, is that he'd win a majority at the general election. So, it, it, in some ways, uh, there's a referendum coming down the tracks that none of us really had expected for years. This document that we have here, this draft, yeah. is, you would say, very different to what was promised back then two years ago. Well, the high vaunting ambitions of Bloomberg, you know, fundamental change in Britain's relationship with the European Union. But even bigger than that, he talked about reform of the European Union itself, as if somehow it was, you know, going to become looser and rather less political. In fact, the opposite is happening. Now, as we're having this negotiation on that document, the rest of the EU are talking about integrating very quickly and very much more closely particularly within the Eurozone. So, so what we've got here is a series of promises for the future and a potential deal, very small deal, on whether Britain can limit migrant benefits. But, you know, whether anybody thinks this is a good deal or a bad deal, here's the problem. The Prime Minister effectively is saying, buy the second-hand car from me. It's a really good second-hand car, but I'm afraid you can't test the engine before you buy it. Because whatever is in this document tomorrow morning, when this is over, can be vetoed by the European Parliament, can be ruled out of order by the European Court of Justice, and there is nothing out of these negotiations that Mr Cameron can guarantee to deliver. What he wants to do is transport some of the language of this document into a future treaty. One British diplomat said to me last night, it is vitally important, if Britain votes to stay in the European Union, that we codify, put into language, what that relationship is going to be. Would you at least accept that some of the text is important and moves us forward? Well, the problem is, this agreement is going to be made with a French president and a German chancellor who in a few years' time won't be there anyway. So, apart from the fact the European Parliament can rule against much of this, that the European Court of Justice actually legally will favour the existing treaties and not promises for the future, we may be dealing with a different set. But if he, if he gets the language in this anyway. text, it will be transported. That's what he's trying to achieve here, isn't he? To ensure that it does well, go into a treaty, irrespective well, of who well, is in charge. He can do what he likes. And he can lodge the document at the United Nations. He can make a series of promises, but he cannot guarantee on delivering on any of those promises. We saw all of this 25 years ago. 25 years ago, the Danes voted no to the Maastricht Treaty. They were given a whole series of promises as to what protocols would be in the next treaty, and in the end, they weren't delivered. And that's the point. He can say what he likes tomorrow on this document, but there is no guarantee he will ever be able to deliver any of it.